Hi, I'm Pete Doctor. I'm a director at Pixar Animation Studios. I'm Chris Merritt. I'm a lead show designer at Walt Disney Imagineering. So, uh, obviously, Walt Disney uh, had a huge effect on the, the medium of animation in general, trained these amazing artists, and along the way, uh, really, I think where this came from was there was a, rev a review board uh, of, of animators whose job it was to oversee everyone else and kind of make sure that they were getting the right um, assignments and so on. And Walt started calling these group of nine the nine old men. They happened to be some of the best animators at the studio, They're, though you could argue that a lot of uh, great artists were left out of that title as well. One of those uh, guys was Mark Davis, who is the guy whose book on his second career, really. Uh, this book is about his work at uh, uh, Walt Disney Imagineering, and uh, Chris has been working on it feverishly for the last, what, three years, and, and even before that. Yeah. I mean, when did it really start? Well, I mean, it really started when I was in Shanghai, so I'm gonna say like 2014, something like that, yeah? And um, just coming up with the idea, but I actually, I remember calling you up from one of our vendors, like on site, like, you know, in, you know just outside uh, Shanghai and saying, hey, you know, Pete, I got this idea for this thing, and I talked to Alice Davis about it, and I mean, for me, to make it about the book here, uh, it's, kind of always been my dream to to get all this concept art and all these designs that some of which people have seen but there's a ton of stuff out there that people haven't seen so the first thing I did when I got to Imagineering in the 90s was go into the art library and look up all of Mark Davis's design because I was such a huge fan of his and there's a plethora of, of unrealized attractions, ideas for things, different gags from Pirates of the Caribbean and Haunted Mansion, and I always just kind of thought, wow, this would be a, make a really beautiful, incredible coffee table book. That's just kind of like a pipe dream I had, but um, in the interim, I was able to uh, write my first two books uh, previous to that, and I was finishing up my second one while I was working in Shanghai, and I had this idea for this third one, and I thought, boy, we better do this now while we still can. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I called Alice up, and I said, Alice, I have this idea, for, but I want to make it a big, beautiful, deluxe coffee table book where we really we rescan, get the colors right on Mark's original artwork, get his intent across. And then I did several interviews with Mark in the 90s and, and visited with him a lot. And I said, I'd like to reference those and other interviews. And uh, so she said, oh, my, yeah, sounds wonderful. So and then she I, gave us full access to yeah, her, yeah. her collection of work. And, of course, Disney has been great about yeah. accessing their work. So yep. the great thing for me in, in reading all this material that, Mark, that, that Chris has collected of Mark's is that it not only presents his brilliant, amazing artwork, but it takes you inside his brain a little bit. You mm. start to understand how he thought, what's important to him, and the process as well. Like you said, it's a, it's kind of the secondary uh, purpose of the book is to show how things worked back at Walt Disney Imagineering. They called it WED at the time. Right. I think uh, it's it's really you know it's it's the, the 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 secret agenda behind this is it's it's a history of WED, albeit from Mark's perspective and the projects that he worked on. But it feels like even today, working at Walt Disney Imagineering, which is uh, where I work. Um, the buildings that all these things were designed in are still there, but there's not really a sense of, well, what happened here and what happened there? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like when you go to the studio in Burbank, the Disney studio, you're like, oh, well, here's the animation building, and here's where, you know, D-Wing was, and yeah. here's where Walt's office was, and here's the sound stages. You get a sense of that history. I, as an Imagineer, don't necessarily feel that. So it's kind of like trying to go back and recreate that lost history. Well. You know, we figured out where Pirates of the Caribbean mock-up uh, auction scene was staged that they showed Walt before he passed away. Uh, or a, a little small building, 800 Sonora, where we designed a lot of the new um, Pandora uh, things for Animal Kingdom. Uh, that was ground zero. That's where they moved when they moved from the studio where they designed all four shows for the New York World's Fair wow, and cool. the Enchanted Tiki Room. And not only designed it, but did the models in there and did the figure finishing. And so when you look at it from that perspective, you're like, wow, this building's historic. It's fascinating to me. So I want to give some context to that. I think that's what we want to do. Mark, from my perspective, is a guy who could be dropped in at any point during the production of any film or any attraction and, and add huge value to it. You know, he was a guy who was a story man. Uh, he was a great animator. He kind of get inside the characters and show how they think and how they move. And a great designer, great colorist, everything. So... You know, he's just a, 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 as Walt called him, his renaissance man. He could kind of do anything. 
Uh, for me personally, I think the thing that I admire the most about beyond his amazing draftsmanship is his ability to capture very specific characters. You know, I mean, the bear band stuff that you just dug up, uh, which we're going to talk about today, is a great example of this. You grab any drawing and you're like, I know who that guy is. It's so clear. In one drawing, yeah. you capture, I can almost hear his voice. I know how he would move. I know probably what he would eat or, you know, <laughs> it's just, it's amazing. I, I think it's it's incredible to, to see the artwork here and you look at it and it's so appealing, right? Um, his his designs have appeal regardless. And um, you you look at this artwork and you think, well, wow, he makes it look so simple is one of the things that stands out to me. Yeah. But you've ever actually tried to draw like Mark? You ever try to stage things clearly? You ever try to have that innate sense of appeal that comes with every piece of artwork I've ever seen by him? That's really, really hard to do. And he makes it look easy. So it's kind of fascinating to me from that standpoint. Since I work for Imagineering from a theme park perspective, I would say... Um, the staging is huge for me. That was one thing when I when I knew him that he always kind of hit home to me as a student. Said, as I say, he's got to make it read clear, you know. And and that was you know. And he talked about how Walt Disney was such a bear on staging was the the phrase he used. So that was really and it's important in animation. And I just think uh, the humor, the humor. I mean, Mark is really the guy who brought laughs and humor and that innate Disney sense of whimsy that you see in attractions like Pirates of the Caribbean or the Jungle Cruise or the Haunted Mansion. Um, Mark is really, really responsible for a lot of that, a lot of that work. On a sort of more surface level too, his ability to capture appeal um, and bridge the between cartoon and real. You know, he just, he had a, an amazing mm -hmm. uh, knowledge of anatomy. And so, well, actually, I think one of his first jobs at the studio at the, when he was an animator was working between two other key animators for Snow White, the lead character Snow White. And he had to find how to capture the sort of um, realism that Walt was looking for, but still make it something you could draw and a uh, cartoon. And so a lot of the stuff in Bambi is, is thanks to his, uh, Mark's ability to capture, again, that kind of bridge between just a really appealing, simple drawing, but still has anatomy. It still feels like it you know, it belongs in, in, the, in the wild. I can't think of many people who've done it. Yeah. You know? Well, he, I think like we were talking about, he had a great sense of anatomy. He taught classes at Chouinard. A lot of animators grew up having been taught by Mark. Um, so the, the, the idea that he's not just drawing kind of a, a graphic something on the, on the page, he's thinking through like how the structure underneath works. Mm -hmm. I think that was a huge effect on, on WED. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because uh, uh, we were talking about earlier how Mark did this whole series when they were working on Mr. Lincoln. He did a whole series of drawings he called uh, Reference for Animated Figures in 1960 at, at Walt's behest, you know, realizing that, that WED, that was what Imagineering was called at the time, was going to be doing more realistic, human-based animated figures. And how would they approach that? How would they do that? And Mark did these beautiful, gorgeous drawings using his innate knowledge of anatomy to show how you could mechanically replicate all the movements in, in, a, in a human being, the rest turns and the musculature and what you would do with that. And at a certain point, what he came to was, this is not what we should be doing at all. We shouldn't be making a full mechanical man that can walk around on its own. What we're doing is we're making the illusion of a man. So in that sense, his animation background really served him well to have that basis, even though what he got to was a very different result at the end. I kind of think his relationship uh, became much closer to Walt as he went into Imagineering, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I know he, he was involved like early in uh, some Bambi story design wor uh, work, and then of course as an animator, but you know, the animators, there were, there were a lot of animators, um, and s at the beginning in the 20s and 30s, they were probably more closely in, involved with Walt, and then as time went on, he just got so busy that they saw less of him personally and were more involved with the directors. Um, but then that changed probably when he went over in around 60. Yeah, I think so. I, I think working at, at WED at the time afforded you a more direct 
one-on-one -on -one interaction with, with Walt Disney, partially because that's where his focus was at the time. That was his, in, in a certain sense, his new toy that he mm -hmm. was very excited about. So, of course, he's going to be more involved. But also, just on the, on the early end of production where you're coming up, we call it Blue Sky now at Imagineering, but you're coming up with those first ideas, those first rough sketches, first drawings. So in, in the presentation today, you'll see the Bear Band drawings. Walt Disney ever saw the end result of what became the Country Bear Jamboree. He only saw these initial, tentative, but beautiful and really well-staged, funny yeah. drawings of bears as circus bears, as jazz bears. And so he got to really, you know, Walt would say, hey, Mark, we're going to do this thing out in Mineral King, and we're going to have a ski resort, and I want to have some entertainment, and I want you to come up with some ideas for bears. Go, right? And then so Mark goes off, and he comes up with these great ideas, these great gags. Of course, Walt's going to want to see that, so he's going to spend some serious one-on-one -on -one time with him. So at that point, I think it got closer. But he also talked, oh, sorry, I was just say he also talked about, you know, he'd see him around town, right? Like, they'd right. go to dinner at the Tama Shanter, and they'd oh, yeah. see Walt sitting by himself, and they'd invite him over to join, and he'd go, oh, kind of, no, no. So he, he did keep a distance to a certain extent, but he was also close to it. In fact, that's how Alice got the job that's right. to do the costumes for It's a Small World, because they were at the Tama Shanter one night, and Walt said, oh, you just got married? No. Oh, you do costume design at Chenard? Oh, well, you'll come work for me one day. And then she got the call to do A Small World. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And there's another great story that you have in the book of uh, um, going back to Bear Bands that that may have been one of the last big laughs that Walt had, you know, he was yeah. pretty sick, he was in the hospital, but there was one day where he kind of came out and went, walked around the studio one last time and he looked bad and there's a, it's really a poignant story where he's, he was followed by a bunch of guys and he says, look guys, I just want to talk to Mark and he chases them all out of the room. So it's just the two of them sitting there and he kind of sits down and you can see that just it's, you know, this disease is wearing on him, mm -hmm. and Mark feels drawn to like, I gotta cheer this guy up, and so he brings out all these drawings of the bears, yeah. and Walt starts <laughs> laughing, and he sort of hypothesizes that might have been the last big kind of up, uplifting laugh that, that uh, Walt ever had. Yeah, it, it really affected Mark deeply, that last visit he had at, at WED in his office on, it's a strip of executive offices we call the Gold Coast now, where Mark had his office right there on Flower Street. And uh, I don't know, it's, it's very poignant for me to walk by there every day and going to meetings and such mm. and then looking over and going, oh, Mark sat there and that's where Walt visited Mark that last time and gave him that great last laugh. And, you know, Mark, it really affected him deeply. He talks about at the end of the meeting, he was feeling tired and asked for some people to take him back from WED to the studio. And they said, OK. And he said he turned around, he walked about halfway down the hall and turned around and looked at Mark and said, goodbye, Mark. And he'd never said goodbye to Mark before, ever. He'd always said, see you later, or let's get together next week, or something like that. And Mark told me he was certain that that was Walt saying his goodbyes to him. So it is very, very touching and very kind of moving to me. I challenge you to find anything about Mark that this guy hasn't already found. I don't know where you got, like there are photographs that I have never seen. I'm, pretty, I'm a pretty big nerd. He found stuff that has never been seen, never been published. Yeah. It's just amazing. So I'll, I'll be curious to hear this answer. <laughs> well, too. that was part of the goal of this book, too, is, you know, part of the thing is, you know, there have been many, many books that have been done on Imagineering, and uh, by their nature, you know, you want to include everything. So what happens is you start to see the same images and the same artwork kind of float to the surface that people use again. And part of that is a from ease thing, and part of that is a, well, these are just the classics that people mm -hmm. want to see. And we do have some of that in our book. I have always felt like there's so much more, and I, I think we're at the point now where the, the interest is so intense. I hope it supports it, because <laughs> uh, we're certainly doing a big, giant, two-volume coffee table book on this, is that people are ready for a real deep dive on these things. So where do you find these things, I think, is what you're getting at. How do you dig this stuff up? And there's a lot, there's a lot I could talk about about that. I think you want to think creatively. I think you want to think outside the box interesting thing to me is, you know, we don't have at, at Imagineering or the Walt Disney Company, we don't have one location where everything is. We certainly have the archives, which is amazing. There are things all over the company. <laughs> and it's kind of knowing where to look. It's also asking questions. And then back to the thinking about outside the box comment, 
looking at old magazines. So, you know, one of the things that I really love about uh, Andreas Deja has a, a blog that he updates, and sometimes he puts um, scans of old magazine articles that were done on animation in the 30s and 40s. You know, here's Walt Disney with his new feature in production. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that kind of got me thinking, well, what is that equivalent on the Imagineering side? So particularly with the New York World's Fair, Look Magazine, Life Magazine, there were a lot of photo spreads where they came to the studio and, and Walt, you know, okayed them coming through and here we are in production on the Ford Magic Skyway, take a million photos. Some of those photos have made it, or like in the National Geographic or some things, um, but again, it's the same two or three photos. And so thinking, okay, there was a photographer there for the day, right? Mm -hmm. Taking photos on assignment, what happened to the film rolls? What happened to the negative sheets of that with alternate shots, with different things we haven't seen before? And then there you kind of go down the rabbit hole, right? <laughs> so, so then, you know, so that led me, there was a photographer who worked for National Geographic who, who kept personal uh, slides. I think he's in his 90s now, and he actually sent the slides. Uh, we have to give a shout out to Vanessa Hunt and the art library, who's really helped us a lot, you know mailed us his slides of like being at Walt, you know, with Walt, full color slides of mocking up the Tiki Room at the studio and, and uh, building the models for the 1964 New York World's Fair and the 800 Sonora Building, photos that no one's ever seen before. Bob Gurr pitching, you know, new ideas for Mr. Lincoln to Walt and the team with little mock-ups. So he sent us all these things, um, but then things like Look Magazine and things like that, um, finding out, well, Look Magazine went bankrupt. Um, so what happened with all the assets? Well, without boring you too much, the <laughs> assets ended up at the Library of Congress. So we got in touch with the Library of Congress and we, we struck an agreement to use them in the book. Um, and they went back and scanned the original negatives and just as I, I hoped, I didn't know, hundreds of images that have never been published before and people haven't seen. Oh, and what's, what's really great about it is it's Walt at work with Mark and the rest of the WED team and they're not posing. Yeah. Right? They're not here we are in our new project. Yeah. They're at work. Or They're clowning pit. with, the, which you right? see a lot of those, which are fun. Yeah, but. yeah. I mean, so uh, that's fascinating to me because I want to kind of try and time travel for this. I want to go back, you know, to the 1960s and be the fly on the wall when they're working on It's a Small World and Mary Blair is there with all her amazing pieces of artwork and Alice is making costumes and Mark's working on sketches and so the guys in the machine shop are talking with, you know, Blaine Gibson and Mark Davis about, and, and Walt's coming in and Roly Crump's there. Want to give a sense to the reader of what it was like in that time and place. And I don't think that's really been done in a book yet. So that's one of many goals we have with this book.